This podcast is sponsored by Bigger Brains, online training that won't bore you to tears. Expand the minds of your workforce at getbiggerbrains.com. Welcome to Permission to Speak, the video blog and podcast that loiters at the intersection of leaders who want their people to speak up, technology that facilitates connections, and results that serve our higher purpose. Now, here's your host, Kelly Vandiver. Hi, welcome to the podcast. It's Kelly Vandiver, and today I have not one, not two, but three people that I'll be interviewing, and they are all from a company called, excuse me, an organization called Perscolis. Perscolis is a nonprofit organization that drives positive and proven social changes in communities across the country. Through rigorous and tuition-free technology training and professional development, the organization takes motivated and curious adults who are unemployed or underemployed and prepares them for successful careers in IT as IT professionals and it creates an on-ramp to businesses in need of their talents. Today Perscolis provides its solutions in six cities across the country Atlanta Georgia Cincinnati and Columbus Ohio Dallas Texas the National Capital Region and New York New York. To date Perscolis has trained over 5,000 individuals helping them build lasting life-changing skills and careers in technology. So clearly you have a great organization that's got a wonderful mission a higher purpose that employees can get behind. But what we're really going to focus on here today is your internal organization and how you've been creating an environment where people feel um, they're able to engage and speak up. So our, our three interviewees today are joining us from Perscolis headquarters in New York. And we have Ken Walker, Vice President of National Site Operations. Ken, could you wave to let everybody know who you are? Thank you. And we have Jerome... Uh, Dizal, although I, you guys call him, what do you normally call him there? Dr. Dazzle. <laughs> and I think that's, uh, you, we'll probably see during the interview because he's brilliant and dazzling, right? Brilliant. <laughs> and then um, he is the director of information systems. And we also have Emily Rodriguez, who is the talent and internal communications manager. So welcome y'all to the podcast. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Kelly. Well, as you know, we start by uh, getting to know our individuals a little bit more as a person. So I have got some some uh, quirky questions to ask you first before we get into the, the meat of the content. So our first quirky can question, what I'll do is I'll ask each of you to answer the question. And you guys might get to know a little more about each other, too, in this process, right? <laughs> All right. So first, who would like to answer? Uh, and tell us what your favorite guilty pleasure television show is. You'd like to volunteer first. So my my guilty <laughs> pleasure is Scandal. Oh, I love I, Scandal. Love Scandal. I love Scandal. But the idea of a person who fixes all problems, so Olivia Pope. And so I call myself Oliver Pope. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think I'm a fix-it kind of guy. Um, but I love that series, and um, it resonates with me for a lot of different reasons. So that's my my little quirky thing. Okay, yeah, I think you're not alone in that addiction. So yeah, <laughs> great. Uh, who would like to go next? And and I would say, and Jerome and I were just talking about this that we love The Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. The Walking Dead is like my favorite show. Um, just because it's cool and it's stressful, they have to survive. Um, so I would say that was my that's my favorite guilty pleasure TV show. Okay, it, clearly I watch way too much television. <laughs> both of those shows. <laughs> and Jerome. Yeah, I'll have to agree with Emily. The Walking Dead. I've been a huge fan of that show for quite some time. I've read all of the graphic novels to date. Oh wow! Uh, so yeah, it's by far my most favorite television show. I I have a, a fantasy of being a zombie on that show because <laughs> I live here in the Atlanta area. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I mean, I'll throw this in there. So sometimes what I do, just to uh, mess around with my family, I, I walk around uh, as a walker, so the way that they would walk. <laughs> I right foot behind me just to freak them out. Just for it. You do not. You do not. <laughs> oh, shoot. Okay. Um, and then our next. <laughs> do you guys believe that? I mean, you guys. Maybe you know them better. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And so um, our second quirky question is, uh, what is your favorite possession? Maybe, Jerome, we can start with you this time. Um, yeah, I'll have to say it's my Xbox One console. 
it's my favorite possession. So yeah, when I'm not uh, out and about or traveling, um, I do love to game. And I'm a pretty avid gamer at, at times when I do have the time. So it'll be my most, yeah, my prized and most favorite possession. So, so even though you do technology at work, you're not done when you get home, you got to do some more, you know, yeah. techie geeky stuff. All right. Excellent. <laughs> Keep it going. All right. Who'd like to jump in next? Okay, so I just bought a Fitbit Blaze over the weekend. So first <laughs> of all, Amazon is like awesome. You can decide in one day you want something and that night you get it. But I am a half marathoner. And so I love the idea of being able to track my steps. And if anybody's interested, I'm up to seven. 9,734 today. What? So that's pretty impressive. Did you walk to work? I didn't walk to work, <laughs> but I ran this morning. Right. Wow. Wow. Okay. I am impressed. <laughs> I'm lucky if I do that in a day. So <laughs> excellent. Okay. And Emily? Uh, so I would have to say my two favorite possessions would be. One, my phone. I'm going to say what everyone is always, everyone's always on their phone and I don't know what I would do without it. I really try to disconnect when, you know, when I get home and I'm not at work, but I feel like we all would be lost without our iPhones. Um, and then I also love to read. So I would say my bookshelf. I have a huge bookshelf at home with all my favorite books. So I would be lost without, without that. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Excellent. Okay. Well, now for the uh, more juicy questions, uh, kind of transition ourselves into the, the content a little more. Um, I'm curious to know, each of you, uh, what's your story? What happened in your life that got you up to a place where you cared about employees having a voice and being able to speak up? Yeah. Um, so before I came to Berscolis, I worked for a nonprofit organization in Baltimore where I trained adults in ways to communicate with their children that fostered social and emotional competence. So I've always been a really big fan of communication. I studied communication in school, um, and I really feel like it's the, the way to um, happiness in the workplace um, and at home. Um, so when I came to Briscolis, I was on, in the marketing department before I was in talent, and uh, my colleague and I built this program that helped give the students, our graduates, a voice. Um, and that was amazing, and um, I saw how powerful it is. I think in our training, we can all agree that when students come in, there's a total transformation that happens once they're given the skills to be successful in the workplace, and that m much of that success is due to communication skills. So workplace etiquette, how to interview, how to write a resume. Um, so I found I really gravitated towards, number one, giving the students a voice, and two, if there was any some sort of um, internal communications project going on, I would kind of figure out a way to get involved. Um, so yeah. I, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so I, I found that I've just always gravitated towards it and um, have really found it effective in transforming our students, transforming our staff, and as well as the work that I did before I came to Perscolis. Very cool. Very cool. So gentlemen. Uh, so the first half of my career uh, I spent in corporate America before I uh, joined a non-for-profit industry and um, specifically in retail banking. And uh, in that, um, it was very performance driven. Um, so everything was on number and um, numbers oriented and results driven. So, um, you know, there wasn't that much of an employee voice um, into initiatives, into projects, as everything, you know, a lot of the uh, programs or initiatives or even new ideas always came from the top down. And um, it didn't really uh, shed the importance of hearing employees, um, not until I joined Persuolas, you know, four years ago. And, and joining the not-for-profit space and the industry for the first time, um, it really gave me that personal approach to working and culture as a whole. Uh, seeing how important, not just in the, um, the the vision and the goals of the organization to help uh, communities and help folks succeed, but seeing how important um, it is for staffers and how very much appreciative they are of that work and how important it is for them to be heard. Um, because, you know, believe it or not, uh, you know, for the four years that I've been here, a lot of our projects and new initiatives was all driven just by regular folks, um, not from the executive team, 
coming down to just by folks sharing their ideas, their innovations, and just having that culture where others would pick that up and just drive that forward or drive that to the next uh, step. Well, and Jerome, as you um, look back at your corporate career, because a lot of folks that may be listening to this may not be in a not-for-profit organization, so they are in that corporate world. Would you see the things that you're seeing at Perscolis translate into the corporate world as well? Um, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, and there, yeah, and there's so many ways uh, to accomplish that. But again, it it all is, uh, you know, it all starts with just a shift in culture and a shift in thinking. Um, but more importantly, is having that executive and leadership, you know, buy-in. Um, you know, if you don't have that buy-in uh, from your executive team or senior leadership team, you know, things can easily die or just fall off the wagon, so to speak. Right. Gotcha. Right. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ken. So mine is a little more personal. Um, so I grew up with um, a mother who was schizophrenic. Mm. And um, I think I had a good sort of insight into what, um, what kind of medication um, um, doctors give to folks who have mental illness. And so um, the, the goal is to make them quiet, um, to, to diminish their voice. And, um, that never really made sense to me. You know, why, why do we give medication, um, to folks to quiet them down? And so, um, I had a recent, um, situation last week that sort of came up. Um, I'm guardian of my mom's health and I had to go into the court system and there, there are tons of papers and lawyers who, who refer to my mother as an IP, an incapacitated person. Mm -hmm. um, and so they don't make it real. And so for me, um, it's always been incredibly important that um, I am willing to hear people, right? Um, it's very important to be seen. I always want people to see me and I want to be able to see them. So, so working with folks and making sure that their voice is heard is incredibly important to me and it's been sort of a, a, a trademark of my career. I, so I spent 17 years in IBM and I did those things as well. But even coming over the Priscolas and folks who work with me, they know that it's really important for everyone's individual voice to be heard. Wow. Thank you for sharing that story with us. I appreciate that, Ken. Um, I, I would imagine too that, just like you guys have already talked about, you really do give voice to the to the unemployed and the underemployed by giving the these the skills and 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 giving them an opportunity. And there's definitely demand. I know in the Atlanta market, that's one of the things you hear about IT uh, is that there's not enough IT resources. There's not enough talent out there, and then we have folks that have need and and want to be put to work so i think it's wonderful what you what you guys are doing um, <laughs> well and and we will definitely put all your contact information for anybody that's interested in learning more about your organization we'll put all that in the in the show notes so that folks can to learn more and donate and get involved as, as well so um so transitioning <laughs> so so transitioning into uh uh, thinking about your organization, um, we had talked earlier, and you had told me about that that you guys wanted to uh, work on your organization culture. So, so tell us about what was going on there, and and what you guys were were doing in this area. Yeah, so a, a couple of years ago, uh, <clears throat> as an organization, we started to think about our national growth. So, in 2012. Um, is when we made a decision that we were going to expand to cities outside of New York, uh, outside of New York. Um, but we realized very quickly that managing a one-site location is very different than uh, managing multiple sites. So um, we went through an exercise where we identified as an organization um, four projects and areas in which we wanted to work on, and one of them was culture. Um, we had heard quite often from employees that, you know, there were issues with communications. Um, and so we knew um, as a national organization that was just going to be uh, a challenge that was going to get larger over time. So 
um, we decided as an organization that culture um, and making sure that we cultivate that culture in a way that's positive across the um, organization was key. Um, we're sort of unique in New York City, so we have about 50 folks in our New York City office, but in our sites outside of New York, it's four to five, right? And so, because they're smaller offices, sometimes, and I'm going to use this phrase, which is not a good phrase, but they feel like the stepchild, right? Everything's happening in New York City, and we're not focusing on what happens in the NCR or Cincinnati. So thinking through as an organization, how do we make everyone sort of feel connected to the larger mission and goals that we have as an organization was incredibly important. Um, but yeah, culture um, is something that is near and dear to all of us in the room. And I think um, over the last year or two, folks have started to see a shift um, in sort of the language that we use, the way that we communicate, that's been extremely positive. Very cool. Very cool. Oops, <laughs> I'm getting a little echo, sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, so what is it that you wanted to, uh, you, you had mentioned, uh, I think Emily, you, had, you were telling me about some culture work that you were doing um, and you had identified some things that you wanted to, to, to make sure were part of the culture as you grew to these um, additional areas. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Or? Sure, yeah. So, so Ken um, set up very well that we invested in this project to define our culture. And um, I, I consider it phase one done, but you know, the rest we, we are still working towards. I think culture is a living, breathing thing. Um, so we really identified the things that we want to keep, the things about our culture that we really like. Um, and some of those were, were really innovative. Um, as Jerome sort of alluded to that, when someone has a really good idea, whether they're at the bottom or the top of the ladder, um, we we investigate and we if it's a great idea we go for it. So innovativeness was really um, top priority. We really wanted to be transparent. That was something that we wanted to build upon, um, and that goes back to the growth. So if something happened in our headquarters in New York, the information needs to be spread widely. People, everyone needs to know what's going on, whether you're here um, or somewhere else. Um, we also wanted to. Uh, keep building on our technology. So Jerome and Ken have been really integral in to building our technology infrastructure. Um, and I, I know we're going to talk about one big project that we've been working on, but <laughs> it really has been years and years of projects building on each other. So we went to you know Google Apps a couple years ago. That was a really big shift to go into the cloud. Um, so the focus on technology as coupled with um, transparency and coupled with innovation um, I think has brought us sort of to where we are today. Which kind of does lead us to, <laughs> to that, that technology <laughs> innovation. <laughs> um, so you guys decided to adopt a tool that would help give people a voice. So maybe Jerome, you could talk a little bit about uh, what you guys decided to do there. Yeah, um, absolutely. So um, before I dive straight into the tool, um, some little bit of context, we explored um, an intranet um, in our early days. Uh, for me, it's early, I, I guess, but it's not that long ago, in 2012. The uh, reason why we approached this in 2012, we felt that we were at a good point um, in our organization um, in terms of starting our expansion to really uh, work on an intranet project where we can bring folks, you know, outside of our New York uh, office, you know, together. Um, but one of the challenges that we ran into that, um, the adoption was high in the first month, but it just quickly fell off um, because we did not um, do enough of the due diligence um, on, you know, on our end to make sure the content um, is up to date. Uh, and more importantly, really understanding um, the usefulness um, for an internet for our staff. Um, so this was a good example of approaching a project from a one-sided view, and that view was a small group of folks uh, thinking about what this would look like um, without really serve, you know, um, doing a, an analysis. Uh, so what you know, folks really needed or wanted to see in an intranet. Um, so uh, for years or three years after that, we've kind of like you know, tagged it along uh, slowly. Maybe it was just used just for one small aspect, which was to access certain uh, HR documentation more specifically the employee manual, but that's about it. 
Um, but coming into uh, this year or late last year, uh, we felt that it was important for us to revisit um, a technology or a tool that will help us to bring our culture um, together. And all of the work that um, that has been done up to date um, around culture, um, we felt that an intranet or a new version of our intranet would have been that tool. Uh, so we did our research um, and we came upon the platform, you know, that's called Jostle um, as a go-to platform. Um, but before we even decided on that, we had a, a small committee, uh, myself, Ken Walker, Emily, and two other folks to really talk about what do we envision our new intranet to be and using that as a baseline um, to make sure that whatever we are going to invest in um, covers most of those things. And it just so happens that Jossel was that product, um, a system that was just off the shelf, um, didn't require much um, you know, developer or app integration. So it's kind of just take it as you go and customize it as needed, but more importantly, use it to the way that you envision uh, your employees and, and the staff um, working on this platform. So how did that work together to create that that ability to give people that uh, um, to speak up and, and maybe Ken you can talk about that I guess with your job title I envisioned that uh, the national piece of it was is, <laughs> sorry I'm a, I talk with my hands a lot <laughs> uh, but that, that 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 was part of your scope of of what you really cared a lot about yeah so um, so I didn't think about this too much but. Yeah, so I was a part of the national growth team in 2012. And so I had the unique responsibility of going to each of the different markets and sort of really getting a sense of what a four, five person um, office looked like and how different it was. And so I had experiences like going to our Columbus office and being on a teleconference call with all the folks in New York City and not quite hearing things as well and as effectively as I wanted to. Um, sometimes being on video um, conference and not being able to see folks in New York. Um, so I just saw a lot of um, communication issues that we had in the sites outside of New York City. Um, and, I, and I spoke to folks, right? And so someone in Cincinnati might share a story with me and I would think, oh, you know, people in New York need, need to know that. And because we're all in New York City, you know, the person in Dallas who has some unique talent that they can bring to the table, we didn't know about it. And so, so this particular tool gives everyone a voice. Everyone. Someone in Dallas. So no more stepchildren, right? <laughs> everyone. Everyone is able to come to the table. Everyone's able to bring their unique talents and skills and brainstorming ideas to the table in a way that I just think it makes for happier employ employees because at the end of the day, we're not hearing as much, you know, those comments like, you know, you're New York centric or, you know, it's all about New York. I do think em employees now feel as though um, they their input is value and and they can share. Yeah, and I think to add to that, our mission with this project was to build or give our employees the platform to share their voice. And we've been really surprised and and happy about the the reaction. But you know you can you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Mm -hmm. We built the platform, and people have been responding really well. So we built it with the research that Jerome. Uh, talked about um, trying to meet the needs of our employees, and I think that we built the right platform because people have been responding. We haven't been; it hasn't been pulling teeth to, to have people <laughs> really, which is, nice. which is wonderful. And people are sharing freely, and it's a really great tool. Well, you guys had shared with me the the kind of engagement rates you're getting. Do you mind sharing with our audience what you've been seeing? Yeah, and uh, so in the first two months, uh, we saw a ninety-one percent uh, weekly engagement rate, and then one hundred percent monthly engagement that, rate. That's just crazy. Platform. That's crazy. So what? <laughs> so what have you done that you feel like made that successful for you? Uh, it's just a very thoughtful way of um, uh, leading up to the launch of our of our platform. Uh, so instead of saying or um, unveiling to staff to say, "Okay, hey, uh, here's a new platform." And you know we're going to start using it as of this date. Um, 
you know, uh, Emily, Ken, and I, we really thought about doing what we call, um, you know, kind of like workshops um, or sessions. You know, we did this uh, three weeks prior to our official launch date. And the essence of these workshops were just to focus on small features of our platform and introduce that to the staff. Um, do this via a webinar format or video conferencing format, so where everyone was invited to join uh, the session and just making it very, you know, very informal. So, uh, you know, something that is fun. Uh, there were refreshments, uh, there's foods. Uh, with each um, week, you know, we always um, did something bigger, a little bit bigger than the prior week. So it really uh, made folks excited to see, okay, what, number one, what was it that we were going to talk about, about this platform? But, you know, more importantly, like, what are we going to give away? Are we going to give away anything? What is there going to be for food? Um, and, we, and we kept them really short. Um, so these are not hour-long sessions. They were just half an hour, um, you know, sessions. So being really thoughtful around that. And then as we led up to our official launch day, folks um, were, they got a product where they were very much familiar with how they should use it. So there wasn't that learning curve that they needed to go through. So here it is, it's on Veil to Staff and they just dove right in. Yeah, and we also, um, I think that we've all learned through our through launching initiatives with the whole organization that when you're trying to launch something new to 75 people that are geographically dispersed, you have to say it 10 times, right? Mm. So you can't just say it once. You can't just say, okay, we have a training and this is what's going to happen. So we really focused on uh, different channels. So we have site leads at each site. You know, we funneled the information to them that this was happening. It came from the top down. Our CEO was involved uh, with the launch. He made an announcement. We had an announcement from our CAO. Um, we also identified a group of, uh, we selected a group of change champions is what they, we called them. And they were really a group of people that we saw that had uh, influence on their sphere of people around them um, and we met with them I would say what two or three times yeah. Um, yeah. and really tasked them with being the leaders within their um, cultures of the community to um, to push this forward and talk about it and go on it and give us feedback um, so they had pre they had sort of pre access to the platform before everyone else um, and that group was really helpful to navigating some of the challenges that would have occurred. If yeah. not. not that we told them, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to say not that we told them, but they also served as our beta testers as yes. well. <laughs> how, how did you select those people? So we, the three of us sat down and we, I think we know the organization well in terms of we know, I guess the, uh, the advantage of having an organization that's only 80 people is that you kind of know everyone, not really super well, but you kind of know every, you know, every microculture, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so we tried to choose people throughout the organization, geographically different, um, that were excited employees. You know, they cared about our work. Everyone cares about our work, but our biggest cheerleaders of Perscolis, um, people that. Uh, were tech savvy that cared about technology. Um, anything else that we really focused people, on? People who have a good personality. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I mean, cheerleaders. seriously, right? You're right, cheerleaders, right? And so, I mean, I can think of Jamika, for instance. Her smile is. We call her smiley. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, her smile is awesome, and she just has a way about her um, that gets people excited. So. So anytime you, you're working on a project where you really are trying to um, increase adoption, get folks excited, you need folks on your team who are excited as well. So, um, so we were very intentional. I mean, we looked at a list. We, you know, we picked folks. We discussed it, um, and I think that was I think that was really important um, in moving this forward. Okay. I I want to ask a question. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I kind of <laughs> want to ask the question. But you will anyway. <laughs> I kind of will. Um, did you, was there anybody that you, and you don't have to say names or anything, obviously, uh, but did you, did you consider, did you cross your mind to say, you know, so-and-so kind of drags their feet about new technology. So if we get that person involved, um, maybe they'll help us convince other people though, you know, if they're on board, everybody will get on board or, or maybe that wasn't, maybe that didn't come up as a discussion item, but I'm, I'm just curious. I got to ask. So I think, in, so I can speak from my experience at <laughs> <laughs> and I think that we've actually employed that 
uh, tactic in the past with other projects. I can think of a few and it hasn't worked out as well as we thought it would. So we found that some people that drag their feet, drag their feet. And it's, it's easier. I found that it's easier to get the people on your side that are going to be on your side than and have them sort of be the influence than try to change people that are supposed to be influencing others. If that makes sense. Nice. Yeah. That's where I agree. And yeah. And to add a very important trait is that we looked at in terms of our change champions is having that influential ability. Um, that was kind of like the top of our list, you know, top of the list. Instead of focusing on getting folks who are not that tech savvy on board, we wanted to folks that had great influence and to help drive others who were slow towards adoption, um, getting them adopted much quicker and much faster. Well, th thank you for letting me put you on the spot for that because I, I know that's a question that other people struggle with and to hear your response I think will be helpful for them. So thank you. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Because I, I think, right, so focus on the positive, right? So focus on the, the, the change agents within your organization that's going to affect positive change, I just think is the way to go. And I think we've seen a shift in culture um, in the last couple of years where we are focusing on assets and things that are positive. And when we talk about our students, you know, they come from the community, but they bring so many unique, fantastic assets to the table. And that's where we want to um, focus on as an organization. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, just looking at my list here. Um, so would you mind sharing some examples? Because it's, it's good to talk about some, some generalities, but if you could talk about some examples of what the tools are doing for you and how that is giving people the ability to engage, um, what's important to them. I mean, because it's one thing to say, uh, to do a well-planned uh, presentation of what the tools do, but you don't get that kind of engagement unless there's actual value that people are getting from, from the tools that you're using. So can you talk a little bit about some examples of what they're getting and then how that's impacted the organization. So there is, um, so a, re a reasonably new employee, um, let's call her F, <laughs> and um, she, has a, she has a drive and excitement for literacy. And um, being new to the organization, um, she got onto the platform and said, hey, I'm interested in providing some, some books and some reading to, to our students. Um, right, so she's, she's activating her passion, which is literacy. Um, she's, she's speaking up in her early days at Prescolis. And I think she was pleasantly surprised by the reaction and the feedback and from response all from all sides. Mm -hmm. Everybody was like, oh, that's a great idea. And they gave their um, suggestions. And um, it was, I know for me as a new employee to walk into an organization and to be able to have a voice early on incredibly important and then have it reinforced by other folks who are kind of strangers in some respects, right? Cause she just joined. Um, and she moved the solution from A to Z. Um, you can't see, maybe you might, but there are some books behind her, <laughs> which F, <laughs> boy F um, has assembled. She has a virtual library. She put a solution um, in place, and she got a lot of um, positive feedback. Um, I, for me, that's what using a tool like this is very helpful in making happen. And that was through a simple, she just sent a message to all staff through the discussion. There's a discussion element to this, and um, it was a really long conversation, and they were able to work out a solution all via electronic communication. Very cool. That wasn't, cool. Um, and that wasn't clouding our inboxes, our email yes. inboxes, right. which right. is another barrier that we've had to communication. So it was, it's been really helpful. I think that's real key for people to understand that it's not like a long email chain that, that was going on. It was a discussion on the platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say, Kelly, another example of um, the, the usefulness of this tool and, 
And the way that it's helped enact change is speaking about the six sites that we have now. We're about to open another location in Brooklyn. Um, we started last year um, from some feedback that we got at a retreat that um, communication is key and we all need to be knowing what's going on at all the sites. So the information wasn't really flowing very well. Um, and so last year we started an email um, schedule, I guess, where all of our site leaders would send an update um, every, you know, once a week, everyone would rotate about what's going on at their site. It's almost a letter from them um, to the rest of the organization and just keeps us all in, this, in the loop of, of what's going on. So that has um, transformed from being an email thing, which we don't even know who was reading it <laughs> because there so many emails, to now it's on Jostle um, as an announcement. So um, site leaders can add photos. They can they really add their personality to these communications, uh -huh. and it really helps not only just convey the facts about what's going on in Dallas or what's going on in D.C., but the personalities of each site leader, because our, our organization is very diverse, um, and it really helps to put a face and a personality to a photo on the Internet, um, and has helped internal communication a lot. And the voice you hear from the Midwest in Ohio is very different than the voice you hear from Dallas. And so um, just thinking through culture and, and so, you know, I remember the early days when I went into a city, I really felt like I was a city slicker going into, you know, the Midwest. And so we as an organization know that it's very important that, that a, an authentic voice from each of the various regions is coming through. And so just incredibly important um, as a culture. Everything can't come from New York because New York is an anomaly. Um, you know, America is, you know, the, the South, it's the Midwest, it's, you know, it's Maine, it's, it's, it's all of us. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so you talked about the discussion boards. What are some of the other uh, things that are valuable for your folks on the on the Jostle platform? Yeah. Um, so people, the uh, just the people section, just uh, knowing everyone in the organization. Um, you know, the last uh, year and a half, we've um, spent a lot of um, you know we've exerted a lot of effort and time into the onboarding of new hires, um, which means, you know, it doesn't matter where you're located, you do come up to our New York office to go through an in-person, a week long, um, or three to five days in length of an onboarding uh, in person. But um, what we've noticed with the launch of the platform is when new hires come in, everyone knows who they are already. Prior to this platform, we just didn't know who they were. Like, who are these people? You know, are there guests of us? You know who are these folks, but just uh, you know knowing who's who before they arrive, it's you know so empowering. But more importantly, for that new hire, um, it is so you know personal. It's so welcoming uh, yeah. that you're coming to a headquarters. But wait, you know how does everyone know who I am? Uh, which is you know, and they pretty, say pretty awesome. And yeah. that's what they say when they come here. It's like everybody knows me. I feel like I've been I belong here. Right, I belong I here, which is cool. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. And then the second piece of this is just uh, celebrating our, uh, updates and sharing updates, sharing shout outs, whether it's a simple birthday shout out or just a celebration of, of something. Um, and it doesn't always revolve around Priscilla's business related work. Um, it could be personal success stories that you know folks now have a platform of sharing with their colleagues at, at work. But more importantly, just having that feedback. Um, and that discussion and the comments from everyone in our organ, not just you know geographically confined to one location, which it was in, in the past. So we've become we have three dimensional, right? Right. So we're, I mean, we're learning more about. So I mean, these guys probably heard a personal story today that they never heard, but and I heard some things I didn't know. Dazzle pronounces his name differently. <laughs> I didn't know that, um, and he reports to me. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but yeah, just being able to learn more about the individuals within your organization, I think, creates a connectedness that is awesome. Yeah, I, I, th I definitely think that personal side. I'm sorry, go ahead, Emily. No, I was going to say the people function is just really helpful. It has a photo. It has a little bio. Um, you can put in your birthday. You can put in your start date. We've been doing a lot of uh, 
anniversary, mm-hmm. Perscola's anniversary um, celebrating lately. Um, so really, it's just helpful to get to know your colleagues. Yeah, and, um, and we also spent quite a bit of time to thinking about the content that goes into the bio. And uh, there's a section in the bio that has tags or, or keywords. So we spent a lot of time going through each employee and really thinking about what those keywords are, making sure that it's aligned with the work that they do at Priscilla's. And the reason for that is that we really want to be thoughtful and provide a platform for folks not just uh, seeing others, but typing in um, uh, something that they're inquiring about and then just having that name pop up uh, to see who's that person that is, whether they're the change champion for this or the person responsible for doing that uh, has been very useful for, for staffers. Have you gotten any feedback from your employees about, hey, it would be cool if it could do this or if it could do that, or are you seeing other kinds of things come up? Yeah, we've, we've actually received a, a couple of um, you know feedbacks. Um, so there are features in here that the platform yet you know, doesn't yet offer. However, um, they do have a forum for us to post um, you know feature um, requests. And you know, in our you know chats with the Jostle team, we also mentioned these features you know to them as well. Um, and we also have um, the privilege of um, getting early beta testing for some of their new features that they roll out. So uh, it's pretty awesome. Very cool. Yeah, Jostle's a great partner. They've yes. been very collaborative with us the whole time. So we're very grateful for their communication. And I made a comment last week, and. I said Canadians are very friendly, <laughs> and I know, but I but I mean that the customer service, um, just being very um, customer focused, um, has been for me sort of a, a, a surprise in a lot of respects. Um, but it is so important to me, and so um, my area of operations, you know, for me, I feel as though we are. The sites outside of New York are our clients, and so it's very important that we are being um, customer focused. And so, anyway, the Jostle team has been awesome as far as um, giving us a, a, a forum to give our suggestions and ideas and tell our story. And um, yeah, it's been pretty incredible. Very cool. Very cool. Well, what have been some of your pleasant surprises along the way as you've been? as you've been rolling this out or as you've been working on this culture work that you're doing? So Jerome and I were talking about this this morning. Uh, we are like, what are some of the surprises that we've had? And we, so last week, so a great example of um, the positive, our positive culture at Perscolis is um, our CEO who has historically, you know, when we were just one or one location in New York, you know, he, he walks the hallways, he says hi to everyone. He knows everyone's name. It's just, type of person he is Um, and that gets harder as you get bigger and now we have a huge staff in New York and he's here he travels a lot Um, so I guess a positive surprise is that he's been engaging on the platform Um, so last week for example we have a staff member who's been here for 17 years and we've all our organization has been around for 21 years so she's been around for almost all of our um, evolution and he you know wrote and posted um, a congratulatory note to her and sent it out to all staff um, so just seeing that type of interaction that, you know, the CEO and the C-suite folks are on there as well and engaging at every level of the organization. That was pretty cool. Very I was excited cool. to see that. Very cool. Very cool. Anything else to add? A surprise. <laughs> um, well, I would say the discussions, so going back to the discussions and the example that Ken gave around the literacy, you know, our locker. Um, in the digital library, but just all of the author discussions that are happening around that discussion feature. Um, so before we roll this out, you know, we you know spent a lot of time talking about what are some of the features of this platform where we may need to spend a little bit more time getting the staffers on board. And uh, for some reason, the discussions was one of those things where we kind of kept at the bottom of the list to say, you know, it'll be interesting to see how folks engage with this aspect of the platform. We don't see this being very highly adopted in the first couple of phases or first couple of months. But, you know, to my surprise, I would say is that, oh, man, it's been a total opposite of that. Um, You know, so empowering to see so many discussions happening and the sharing of ideas and, you know, innovative things and thinking um, is very, yeah, powerful. 
Yeah, I don't know if it was an article or an announcement, but our site lead in Dallas um, posted a story on, um, I mean, he, he talked a lot about the updates in Dallas, but he talked about Jackie Robinson. Um, and I just remember thinking, I never would have known. It was, I just found it interesting that he posted um, something org about, wide. right, org wide about, you know, African American history and him having the courage to post that and then um, communicating that across all the site. I, I just think that was interesting. And I think it helps to embrace the diversity that is Priscolas in a lot of respects with our students. Um, the organization um, is focused on a campaign right now where we're embracing diversity. And so hearing unique stories um, from the various areas within our organization, I just think is going to make us stronger um, as we uh, lend our national voice to the conversation on diversity. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Well, what, um, I, I'd like to give a, a couple of minutes for you guys to, to uh, talk about, is there anything else that we haven't discussed that you think might be good for leaders to know is if they're going on a similar journey of, of engaging people and, and, giving them the opportunity to have a voice? So I would say, um, I want to just reiterate what we've already talked about, about the culture change. I guess the, the behavior shift of adopting a brand new platform. Um, so as we've said, our organization is very diverse. We have all ages, all backgrounds, you know, all colors, all, we have a very diverse staff. So you can imagine that um, trying to, get everyone to do the same, to be on the same platform and do the same thing can be a challenge. And, and I think that if, if you're going through this type of uh, change, it's really important to, to take your time and do the research mm -hmm. and really think thoughtfully about multiple, many, many channels of communication and how to get the message out. I think that's been a really important learning for us, not just for this platform, but in the future when we're rolling out future initiatives, whatever they shall be, um, that the phased approach, the, the mindfulness of, of having change champions, um, and really focusing on the positive, focusing on our assets rather than the few people that might be naysayers in your organization. I think that's we've learned from that, and uh, we're really <laughs> we're much stronger uh, for it. So bad. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. Very yeah. cool. Uh, and I would just add to what Emily's saying is just being really thoughtful and doing your research. So I would say from an information systems or from an IT perspective is that you know in launching any new product or new platform, you know, we, we tend to first look at the platforms that are out there and try to make that platform or make sure that platform achieves what we're looking to achieve. But I think with this we just did the opposite of that. So the last thing that we even looked at was the technology. But the first thing we focused on is what do we need as an organization um, in this intranet? And really, you know, having you know lengthy discussions around that, then agreeing on here's what we need, then looking for a platform that matches that. There were tons of um, big name platforms that came up in our research, but again, it did not offer what we needed, and we found a platform that did just that. And you know, it paid off huge dividends now. And last piece is not to worry about pricing. Um, you know, pricing for various things differ. Um, you know, again, being conscious also of your budget and more so as a non-for-profit, but if we feel that uh, something is out of our budget, but it still achieves 90 to 95% of what we're looking for, it is definitely worth the investment. I felt Jocelyn was a partner early on, and so, so we had phone conversations with a Jocelyn rep, and we talked through um, on multiple occasions, you know, what we were looking to achieve. And so there was a lot of back and forth. It was an iterative process. Um, we, as the core team, learned um, up front. I mean, we felt comfortable as we were rolling out um, this new tool, which was pretty huge for us, um, to the organization. But that's because our rep, who I'll just say, Jocelyn Rep T, um, <laughs> was, I felt like a partner. And so with us every step of the way, when we launched, 
this person wanted to call us and know what happened. They wanted to see pictures of our big celebration party. And that kind of collaboration with, um, with an organization, I mean, I, don't, I personally don't see that. Um, when I typically look at bringing in a new um, product. So, yeah, that that speaks volumes to me as to what the Johnson organization is all about. Um, definitely felt like I had somebody in the boat with me. Very nice. Very nice. Well, before we sign off, is there anything else that you'd like to add about uh, Perscolis or, or uh, anything that you'd like to share with the, with the leaders out there that uh... – folks that might want to tune in and, and, uh, and find out more about your organization. Do you want to give a shameless plug? No, Please do. That's a shameless plug time, yes. <laughs> so Perscolas really does create on-ramps for businesses. We really do. I guess I always say the proof is in the pudding, and we are the real deal. <laughs> I know it's, it's coming from us, but um, if you know anyone that is unemployed or underemployed that is passionate and curious – uh, please encourage them to apply for our training in, in any of the cities. Um, and as the talent manager, people, I'm hire, I do all the hiring at Priscilla's. If you want to work for us, go to our <laughs> website. Uh, we are hiring a lot right now. Yes. So um, I think I can speak for all three of us when I say that we're really proud to work for Priscilla's and um, really hope that we hear from people that are listening to this uh, podcast. Very cool. And I would say... So Priscolis has been very keen in, in developing partnerships with employer partners, right? So we have a training program. You know, our goal at the end of the day is to get 80% of our folks um, jobs in information technology. So it is a, a constant that we are always looking at employer partners who can come in and work with us, help collaborate with us on a new curriculum, um, talk to us about hiring our students. And so at the end of the day, it really is. So we, we, we spent all this time with you, Kelly, to talk about our staff. But we, I think what drives us is being able to hear the testimonials of students in the community who, you know, got their first job in IT and now they can help their families, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, achieve the goals that they have. And at the end of the day, it's just ordinary folks that we're working with who we're helping to change their life. So if you're an employer partner um, and you're interested in hiring very talented, very curious, proactive folks, um, check us out. Definitely check us out. We do good work. Very cool. Very cool. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us this afternoon for the podcast. I'm so uh, delighted that you were able to share your story and keep up the good work. You guys do wonderful, wonderful things out there. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Bye-bye. This podcast was brought to you by Bigger Brains, online training that won't bore you to tears. Expand the minds of your workforce at getbiggerbrains.com. Thanks for tuning in to Permission to Speak. If you want to increase collaboration and innovation in your organization, check out more resources available at speakingpractically.com or give me a call, Kelly Vandiver, at 770-597-1108.